I'm very happy to be here. Katie took me on a driving tour yesterday and, and we had a chance to experience the city. And it's really a very remarkable place. And I think that Greenville stands at a very interesting moment in its growth, a, a small town that is becoming a big city, whether it likes it or not. Um, and, and a moment where transit and housing and land use really become important issues. So Katie's told you a little bit about me. Um, I live in Houston, Texas, but I don't live in the Houston you probably have pictured in your mind. This slide here is my life. You can see where I live, you can see where I work, and you can see the light rail train that takes me from one to the other. I point this out because I ride transit every day, and the reason I ride transit every day is it makes my life better. It is, makes me happier, it makes my life more convenient, it makes it easier to do the things I want to do every day. Um, and I believe good transit makes great cities, that at the core of every great city, there is a great transit system. And that is not an accident. It's because transit is an integral part of what makes cities work well. And I'm really focusing today on transit in the traditional sense of the word transit. As the book title says, I am talking about trains and buses, and we have a tendency to get distracted when we talk about transit. We have a tendency to talk about hyperloops and autonomous vehicles and TNCs. But the reality is that transit in the idea of a bus on a regular schedule running down the street still has not been beaten by any other technology in terms of how well it works to build cities. And we can talk, and I'm sure we will in the Q&A, about some of the other technologies out there, but realize that they don't scale the way transit does. Um, a suburban town outside of Toronto experimented with, let's not do our transit system and instead just give lift subsidies for the passengers instead they are now having to curtail that program because they discovered it doesn't scale. The nice thing about a bus is adding one more passenger has no additional incremental cost. Ordering another Uber, it turns out, does. And now that system is literally running out of money. So a lot of my talk today is about basics. It's about how to make transit work. And these rules are true in big cities like Houston. And these rules are true in much smaller cities like Greenville. And I think it's important to start talking about why do we want transit? Because I think a lot of the, what we do in this country when we talk about transportation, when we talk about transit, is we don't actually explicitly talk about our goals. We don't really talk about what we're trying to achieve. And I don't think we have a good conversation unless we start with that. So one goal that most transit systems are given is the idea of serving as many places as possible. The idea that we are all paying into the system, we want it to go all the places where everyone is. This is a bus literally running through the open desert outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico. You can tell from this picture that that bus is not picking up a lot of ridership. Now, there's nothing wrong with the goal of trying to serve everywhere. There are places that actually do this. This is Switzerland, and Switzerland has a national goal of everyone in Switzerland is within walking distance of transit. So there's a little village with 30 people in it, and because that village exists up on the mountain, that bus route exists, because that bus will go there to pick up those 30 people. It's really expensive to do that, as it turns out. It's really expensive to provide service everywhere, but transit is a public service, so that may be one of the goals that we have, but there's a whole series of other goals we should think about. One of them is actually the diametric opposite to what I just said, which is carrying as many people as possible. You should always realize that those two are opposites, that we have a choice in a transit system of concentrating service in the places where the most people are, which will lead to the highest ridership, or we have a choice of trying to cover everywhere. So if you're an elected official and you ask for one of these, realize you are asking for the opposite of the other. You can do one or you can do the other, but you can't do both. That, for example, if we look at Houston's bus network, on the right-hand side are our bus routes that run every 15 minutes or better all day. On the left, in gray, are all the other routes. Those routes on the right are carrying three quarters of the ridership. That is where the demand is concentrated. That is where the service is concentrated. 
The other routes on the left are what we call coverage routes. Those exist to provide service to places where we feel there is a need for service, but we know the ridership won't be high. We have a whole different set of expectations for the routes on the left than we do for the routes on the right. And one of those expectations is the idea of providing a safety net. I think this is one of the most essential things transit does, and it's really important to think about it that way. There are people who cannot drive, who have no access to a car, and that may be because they cannot afford it, but it may also be because they are disabled and are unable to drive by themselves. It may be because they are young. It may be because they are old. There is a significant portion of every place in the United States which is made up of people who do not have the ability to get behind the wheel of a car, and transit is a safety net that gives them options. It may even be people who have a car but it's in the shop one day. Transit can be a safety net to give them that option. And in that way, transit becomes a kind of essential utility. But we need to be really careful in how we talk about this. One of the things I see a lot of places do is, is frame transit around this idea of we have choice riders and we have dependent riders. And I think this is a problem in both directions. In one direction, when we start talking about choice riders, I think we get a very incorrect picture in our head. We are picturing a choice rider as maybe it's an attorney, they're driving a BMW, they want USB ports on the bus. We, we start imagining this sort of luxury service we need to provide to attract choice riders. The world is a spectrum. If you look at income levels, for example, there are people on the high end who can afford anything they want. There are people on the low end who can't afford a car. There are a lot of people in the middle. A lot of the biggest opportunities to grow transit ridership are people who are somewhere in that middle. There are people out there who own a car but cannot afford a car. They are scrimping on groceries, they are scrimping on toys for their kids in order to be able to make that car add up. And they are one broken transmission away from not having that car anymore. Those are households who would really benefit from a better transit network so they don't have to make those hard choices. So first of all, choice rider, there's a lot of people who are open to transit for who are pretty close to having transit be a good choice for them, but we're not giving them that choice. The second is the second half of that. As soon as you think of somebody as a dependent rider, you start to take them for granted. You start to think as a transit system, this is somebody who will be riding transit no matter how bad the service is. This is somebody who I can offer some really bad choices and they will have to live with it anyway because they have no other choices. And number one, that's not the reality either. At the end of the day, everybody has some choices. But secondly, it leads to us putting really bad transit on the ground. It's interesting when you look at the comprehensive operational analysis for GreenLink and you, and you start to see this break down. There are definitely people riding GreenLink right now who had the choice of a car to make that trip. And on the other hand, there are also people who have other options. There are people who might have gotten a ride from a friend and could have made that trip in another way. So I don't think it's useful to think of the world as choice or dependent riders. I think it's useful to think of the world as what kind of options are we offering people? What kind of opportunities do we give them? And realize that the most successful transit systems in the world are those that serve everyone. The New York subway is good enough that everybody in New York sees it as a viable form of transportation. And the things that make it that good also make it good for everyone we'd consider a dependent rider. The fact that it's fast, the fact that it's frequent, the fact that it's reliable is really important if you're trying to get to a low-wage service job. Good transit ultimately works for everybody. Which leads to another goal, providing economic opportunity. Transit is a means to allow people to better their lives. Transit is a means for people to get to jobs they cannot get to otherwise. Transit is a means of allowing people to go to college and get a degree and get a better job there. Transit is a means of allowing people to access things that they would not have the choice to access otherwise. And that is something that becomes really important in an area like this where a lot of the jobs are service jobs, where a lot of those are warehouses and manufacturing facilities and distribution facilities, which aren't your traditional downtown jobs. If transit doesn't connect to those places, people who can't drive don't have access to that opportunity. And we can also have different kinds of economic goals. We can ask, 
Can transit promote development? And the answer to that is an emphatic yes. This is Houston, Texas. This is our light rail line. Everything you see in color on that map is a new building that was built after construction started on this line. This opened 2003. It has entirely transformed the place around it. Main Street in downtown Houston was a place where no developer wanted to build a building until transit went in on that street and completely transformed how people saw that street. So done well, transit can be a driver for building cities. And this is not just true for rail, it's true for good bus networks as well, and it's not just true in big cities. Is transit a way to get people out of their cars? Is transit and a way to address traffic congestion. And absolutely, I would caution, the key thing to think of here is this is an option. This is another way to travel. This is giving people choices. But if we want to do this, it's not just about building transit. Um, here are a couple of growth of southern cities. So here you see Atlanta in the year 2000 um, with population density. The green is low density. And then you'll see the suburbs sneaking outwards what you are seeing here is a city growing further and further outwards. And what Vince has talked to you about, this is a form of growth which, number one, is not particularly economically sustainable. The tax base doesn't work well for this. But it actually also doesn't work well in trying to link transit. You have here the MARTA system in Atlanta, which didn't grow over that time period. As that city grew outwards, it invested massively in new highways. It did not invest in expanded transit. And as a result, you see a city that's getting more and more congested. And it's getting more and more congested because of the fundamental land use decisions about how Atlanta has grown. You see the same thing in Raleigh-Durham. Look at that outwards growth right there. What you are seeing is the larger cities that surround you have all taken this path of increased outwards growth, car-dependent outwards growth, and if you're seeing that traffic congestion as you drive through those cities today, that's what that traffic congestion is coming from. Here, Charlotte, again, there's some really nice transit in here, but you can still see the city growing outwards and growing outwards in forms that really won't ever work for anything other than a car. You're much earlier on. You still are at the point where you can make decisions about what kind of place you want to be, whether you want to grow as the kind of place where transit can be a viable option, where people can have that choice. But if the solution is to simply widen highways, if the solution is to depend on cars for everything, you know that when this highway widening happens, it will not solve congestion. One of the things we have learned is that adding highway lanes creates more traffic. And as you create more traffic, it simply fills up those highway lanes, and a decade later, you are back to widening that highway. In Houston, we built the widest interstate in the United States, and it is now as congested as it was before the widening. All of that additional growth, all that additional capacity simply went to additional growth. Transit is a way to offer an option. Transit is a way to offer people a different way to get through that. Are we trying to reduce environmental impact? Absolutely. Good transit protects natural places. And there's some obvious ways in which transit helps the environment. You can think about reduced energy use, for example. You can re think about reduced emissions. But I think the most important one is actually this. That train on the left fits 400 people in it. All of those cars combined on the right are 40 people worth of single occupant vehicles. Cars take a huge amount of space. Car-based development takes a huge amount of space. And all of that space is farmland. All of that space is natural land that has to be bulldozed in order to fit all of that. The essential space efficiency of transit is part of what allows transit to make great cities. It's funny if you think about it. In an average office building, an office worker is assigned less space than their car is. Their cubicle is actually smaller than their parking space. Think about the economics of that. We're spending more time building buildings for cars than we are building buildings for people. Um, and that's part of the reason why, if you look at any major world economic center, there is a transit center, a transit system at the center of it. Try to imagine the island of Manhattan if you had to build enough parking to serve all of the people who are in that island. Now, 
We can look around the country and we can see when you do this well, um, you can actually see real impact. This is Seattle, obviously a much larger city than Greenville, but it's interesting to me because I think some of the growth patterns we're seeing here are actually somewhat similar. So downtown Seattle, 75% growth in population, 26% growth in jobs. Over that same time period, they managed to cut the number of cars headed down into downtown Seattle by 20%. And the reason I say this looks similar is I look around downtown Greenville right now, and I see exactly that kind of development pattern, but on a smaller scale. I see new residential, I see new retail, I see new office buildings. Um, and so there is an opportunity in what we think of as a car-centered country to really develop in ways that provide options and where people take those options. I always like to think of it, Americans may love their cars, but I don't think Americans love their commutes. And we can provide other options there. And here's Toronto, for example, nice walkable neighborhoods. Those are single family houses in the background, but neighborhoods where a third of people choose not to own a car because transit can make a living that convenient. So what makes transit work? We want to achieve these things, what do we have to do? And this is really what the book is about. I looked at every metropolitan area in the United States that has rail or BRT, a total of 47 of them. I compared all of them, looked at which ones are succeeding and which ones aren't, looked at why they made the decisions that they did, and looked at what is it that makes each of those systems work or not work. And then I also look at the context of how we fund things like how does federal funding drive the design of transit. Um, and I also looked at what makes transit successful. And I would boil that down to a few simple things that I'm gonna talk about. And I think this is really important to talk about because we do a lot of transit in the United States. Here's a map of rail transit construction in the United States. But our successes vary hugely, that some cities have much higher ridership than others, some systems do much better than others. And all of that comes down to some fairly simple things that I'm gonna talk about now. And these are universally true. These are true regardless of how big or small your city is. These are true regardless whether your system is bus or rail. These are true regardless of all of these characteristics. These are the basics of what makes transit work. So the first is density. Transit is more successful the more people are around it. So here's Honolulu, for example. You can see the pattern of population density in Honolulu, and you can see a transit system that serves that pattern of population very well. You can see how the transit matches where the people are. We tend to think of transit as lines. So this is Dallas, for example. But that's not really what transit is. Transit is stops. Transit is where you can get on and off. And all successful transit systems are based on pedestrians. You know that at least on one end of the trip, every transit rider will be a pedestrian. Even if you drive your car to a park and ride, you will not have a second car waiting for you at the other bus stop. So you are going to need to walk. And what that means is what this transit system really is, is a series of circles. Every stop is a quarter mile to half mile circle. And what's in those circles is what that transit system serves. The more people live in those circles, the more people have access to transit. The more jobs there are in those circles, the more jobs they can get to. The more restaurants or more cultural institutions, everything is about what's in those places. And so density is the key to transit. And that means that some of the most important transit decision makers don't work at transit agencies. It means that zoning, it means that land use policy, it means that development is the key to successful transit. Um, this is Portland, Oregon, famously known as one of the most um, transit-friendly cities in the United States. But everything you see in yellow is single-family zoning, which means in everything you see in yellow, the city government is telling you that you are not allowed to build any kind of density on your land. That if you own that piece of property, there's only one thing you're allowed to do with it. And that one thing you're allowed to do with it actually legally limits how many people have access to that transit system. So land use policy and transit policy are inherently linked. But we can also say, and you can point to plenty of examples here in Greenville, there is a real opportunity to change density. Density is not a given. Cities evolve, cities can change infill development, redevelopment, 
good choices of new development, allow you to make a place that works better for transit. And this is one of the key takeaways from what I'm saying today. Right now, you are at a point where you can still make a lot of these decisions in how this city develops and how transit friendly it will be. Next activity. It's not just about where people live. It's where they work. It's where they do everything else. This is Houston. Our light rail line is successful because it connects multiple centers together. You see the medical center at the bottom. You see the downtown at the top. Every city has multiple centers. Here's Boston, for example. You look at downtowns. You look at universities. You look at secondary employment centers. But that's true here as well. You look at things like hospitals. You look at things like college campuses. A city is a multitude of different activity centers, all of which have jobs, all of which have education, all of which have reasons to go there, and good transit systems link those together. Um, it's important, too, to realize that this isn't just about work. Um, if we really want transit to be useful to people, it needs to be there for everything they need to do. If you look at the cost of owning a car, Driving less doesn't actually help your household budget a whole lot. That most of the costs of a car actually fits. That you are going to make that car payment, you are going to have to make oil changes, you are going to have to pay for your insurance, regardless of if you drive more or less. And so if we really want to help people, we need transit to be there for all of their trips. And that's also true when you start thinking about a day. What you do in the course of a day. If transit is there to get you to work, but transit isn't there to get you to all those other things, transit is not going to be useful to you. So if you can't get to church on Sunday morning, you can't get to the grocery store on the weekend, then you can't depend on transit. And moreover, if you are going to the grocery store on Sunday, that means somebody else had to get to work on Sunday. And I think one of the mistakes we make in thinking about transit is we think we live in a nine to five world, and we don't. We live in a world today of service jobs. Service jobs that have unpredictable shifts, service jobs that require people to be there any time of the day. If you're a bartender, for example, if you work in this hotel, are you going to be done with work by 7.30 to catch the last bus of the day? No, you are not. Um, and that means that transit isn't an option for you. One of the interesting things we did in Houston when we redesigned our network is we actually cut weekday transit service. We are actually running less transit service on an average weekday. And instead, we transferred that survey to service to Saturday and Sunday. And within the first year, we had a 33% increase in Sunday transit ridership. The demand was there, we just weren't serving it. And if you look at Greenville's transit system, this is one of the big shortcomings here. Service from 5.30 to 7.30 on weekdays, somewhat less on Saturday, no service at all on Sunday. There are a lot of jobs in Greenville for whom that, works, that transit schedule simply does not work. And again, if you think of someone who's dependent on transit, this might mean you're trapping them in their house on Sunday, that literally they have no ability to do anything on Sunday and are leading a less rich life as a result of that. Next, walkability. Because like I said, transit starts with pedestrians. And that includes good quality pedestrian environments, which we often forget. We spent $300 million on a light rail line and didn't provide an improved sidewalk on the left because, well, we don't think of that as part of transit. Transit is a door-to-door -door trip. And if we invest in good pedestrian infrastructure, we make transit more useful. And that is definitely something that you need more of down here. I am seeing some nice projects on the ground that I'm starting to see some improvement there, but that's not what it should feel like to be a pedestrian. That's also about connectivity. It's the same network point we heard about earlier, that if you get off transit, what can you actually reach? Here's a case of an old-fashioned grid that's downtown Houston on the left and a suburban street pattern on the right. The large circle is the theoretical half-mile walking distance. In white is what you can actually get to. And you can see here what a connected grid does for you. All of those pedestrian connections on the left means almost everything in that circle you can actually get to. On the right, a suburban street pattern, most of that circle is actually inaccessible to you, simply because the pedestrian connectivity isn't there. 
And getting transit in the right places is so important. These are two examples. This is the Texas Medical Center in Houston, a series of three light rail stations, 13,500 boardings a day. This is the Dallas example, a larger medical center, but in its stations, only 3,000 boardings because that transit isn't in the right place, because it's at the edge of things rather than the middle of things. And we saw the example here, looking at Walmart, look at where the front door is, look at where the parking lot is, and look at where the bus stop is. Transit should be where people are trying to go, not somewhere kind of near where people are trying to go. And again, that's a land use decision as much as it is a transit decision. Connectivity, how does a network tie together? People don't use transit one route at a time, they use it as, an, as a network, and if you look at the most successful transit systems in the United States, they're systems that connect multiple things together. Kansas City streetcar, for example, what you will see here is frequent bus routes and a streetcar working together. That you are taking the bus to downtown Kansas City, the streetcar lets you get to Crown Center. Those two working together make a much more useful system than one bus route by itself or one streetcar route by itself. Which also means fares have to work. This is Philadelphia and this is an example of how not to do transit fares. This is the cost to get to downtown Philadelphia color coded. It varies by which agency you ride on, it varies by which mode of transit you use, and it varies by how many times you need to make a connection. Transit ought to be a seamless connected network, something that lets you move from one thing to another without thinking about how am I going to pay, how much is it going to cost me. And of course, the places where you connect need to be good places to connect. And I think that's one thing, You're, you've got a great downtown transit center, it's on a really good site. Those kind of connecting points become really important. Frequency, something that you don't think about if you drive. There is no such thing as frequency with your own car. When you get to the driveway, the car is there ready to leave whenever you are. But that's not how transit is. With transit, what matters is when it's actually going to leave. And it turns out this is incredibly important. We're used to, for example, thinking people will ride rail rather than bus, but here's an example from Chicago. You've got a train station there, you've got a bus route there, both go to the same place. The bus gets 10 times the ridership that the rail line does for one simple reason. The bus runs every five to 16 minutes, the train runs maybe once an hour in the middle of the day. People want transit that is there when they need it. You think about what that means for a trip. The total trip time is walking, waiting, and riding. And so the difference between, say, five-minute frequency and 30-minute frequency is a difference between an average 22-minute trip or an average 35-minute trip. Few things slow down transit as much as infrequent service does. And when you really start thinking about what does it mean to run hourly service, which is what the Greenville system offers. Hourly service means you might have a choice of either I'm going to be five minutes late or 55 minutes early. Infrequent transit means you have to plan your life around when the transit is rather than seeing transit as something that's there for you when you need it. So one of the best things you can do is take every hourly route you have and make it a half hourly route. Take every half hourly route, make it a 15 minute route. Frequency makes transit a lot more useful. And that shows up. Here's Las Vegas, Nevada, which has much higher transit ridership than any of its peers. You look at that, it's not because they have a nice snazzy monorail, it's because they actually have some of the best footprints of frequent bus service in the United States. Frequency gets you ridership. This is one of the things we did in Houston. This was our old network. Red routes were every 15 minutes, blue routes were every 30, green routes were every hour. We took a system that looked like this on a weekday, that looked like this on a Saturday, that looked like this on a Sunday, and turned it into a seven day a week system that looks like this. Look at that comparison from that to that. That is why Houston is one of the few cities in the United States that's actually growing transit ridership right now. These are the same buses on the same streets, but running more frequently in a better connected network and more people are riding. What we did is we went from a system where 25% of people had access to frequent service to a system where 75% of people did. Travel time, how long will it take you to get there? And the key here is that's walking, that's waiting, that's riding, and that's walking on the other end. Think about all of these pieces 
and what you can do to speed them up. And part of that is also system structure. This is one of my favorite bad bus routes in the United States. I challenge you to figure this out, City of Commerce, California. The, the bus takes an hour to make that loop. It runs every hour and a half. That whole route is less than a mile and a half wide. If you try to map yourself out along there, you will see that it is going out of your way to get you to where you're actually trying to go. Um, loops are one of the enemies of transit travel time. Think about the route at the top, a two-way route on one street, and the route on the bottom, which is a loop. Okay, I'm going outbound, and the trip is the same on the two. Great. But when, what happens when I want to go back? On my two-way bus route, my trip back is exactly the same as my trip out. On the loop, I am now going to have to ride all the way around the loop to get to where I'm going. If you look at Greenville's transit system today, it is a system based entirely on loops. It is a system based entirely on taking people the wrong direction to go where they want to go. And that is entirely due to lack of resources. You look at the comprehensive operational analysis, you look at the transit development plan, it has a plan for getting all of these routes away from loops onto two-way routes, which will make a huge difference in the time it takes people to navigate this city. You need the funding to make that happen. So that is the first and easiest thing you can do to speed up transit in Greenville. The other thing you can do is think about connections. One of the things we learned in Houston is we had a downtown-centric system. Everybody had to get downtown to go anywhere. By setting up more connection points and more places, we were able to do things like take a 90-minute trip and make it a 50-minute trip. That's saving somebody 40 minutes one way. Multiply that by two to get um, 80 minutes a day. Multiply that by five. Think of what it means in somebody's life to get that kind of time back by making a better connected transit system. And it means getting trans in the middle of things. It means getting those stops where people's walks will be short so that all of their time works. Transit's also about reliability. And this is actually as important as speed because reliability is what causes you to lose your job. If you show up late to work, the boss doesn't really care whether the bus is unreliable. They just are going to tell you you're late, and if it happens a couple times, you won't have a job anymore. And I think this is one of those things where we have to really understand how hard this hits low-income residents. Like in my job, director of planning, vice president, if I show up late to the office, everyone assumes I was doing business development or had some kind of important phone call. Um, if, I'm, if I'm a busboy in a restaurant and I show up late, I get no excuse. I lose my job. That kind of reliability is essential to allowing people to live their lives. If you look at what buses do, this is an example from Minneapolis, 42% of the time moving or in traffic, 23% of the time at a red light, 32% of the time boarding. You want to make buses more reliable, you think about all of those things. You think about are there places where they want to have dedicated lanes? And this is something you ought to be thinking about now. You look at the population patterns today, and you're like, no, we're not quite that dense. Our ridership isn't that high. You are building the streets that you will have for the next 20 or 30 or 40 years. You are building the highways that you will continue to depend upon. A bus that has a dedicated traffic signal, so it is allowed to make a left turn from the right-hand lane. Just that little piece of intersection design makes that bus route more reliable. There's lots of little things you can do to help. And it's things like, what is the experience at a station? How long does it take somebody with a wheelchair to board? Now, this is a really nice example, a bus platform that's actually the same level as the bus, so you can roll right on. But just having a good, wide ADA landing pad so that person in the wheelchair and the bus driver don't have to do like really sophisticated choreography to get that wheelchair on the bus, will make that bus route faster, will make that bus route more reliable. And it's legibility. This is one of the things that I think we don't talk about enough. How do we make transit easy to understand? And I like this picture. This is Santa Monica, California. In the distance, you can see the beach. So you can see where you're trying to get to. You can see the transit. You can tell where it goes. And you can see the path from one to the other. This is a good transit experience. Um, and some of that is branding. This is one of my favorites, the Roaring Fork Transit Authority in, in Colorado with their Velocirafta. Um, so making transit distinctive helps people understand it. Um, 
But it's also lots of little things. This is the A-line in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And what I love about this is the passenger information. What you will see here is you will see a schedule with everything you need to know as to how to ride this bus. You'll see a map as to where it goes. You'll see information about what the fares are. You'll see real-time information that tells you when the bus is actually coming. And the most radical thing of all, you will see a name. It turns out just naming a stop makes a system easier to navigate. We're used to rail stations have names, highway on-ramps have names. Why don't bus stops have names? If you're trying to give somebody a directions on how to use the system, those things really matter. What things like this do is they make transit easier for first-time riders. What things like this do is they make transit easier for people who don't go to the same place every day. Things like home health care aides, for example, whose job includes traveling around the city and going to lots of different places all the time. We run most of our transit systems for people who already understand the system. And that's a formula for not increasing ridership. It's also things like making bus maps easier to understand. Um, how do you make that bus map legible? How do you make it easy to follow? The Houston bus map, for example, shows you frequency. The red routes run every 15 minutes. The blue routes every 30, the green routes every hour. Just that bit of information makes this map more useful, makes the system easier to navigate. And obviously, we don't want routes that look like that. It's amazing how complex our systems are. This is a section of St. Paul, Minnesota. Every color is a different bus number. Every line is a different version of that bus. So you don't just have to get on the number 74. You have to get on the correct one of five different variations of the 74. In one case, on one street, there are two versions of the 74 which both go downtown. One of them goes northbound that street. One of them goes southbound. We are expecting people to figure this out. And why is this? Why in the world would a transit agency design this? Two reasons. Number one, they don't have enough money. And number two, they have elected officials telling them, we just opened this new community center and we need you to bring the bus there. But we want you to change things as little as possible. You combine those two factors and you end up with these really complex systems. And we're driving people away from transit by making it harder to understand. Um, I think transit should be part of the basic structure of a city. And that's what part of what we tried to achieve in Houston. On the left, one street that used to have five different bus routes along the length of the street. On the right, that street now, there is a Shepherd Street, there is a Shepherd bus. It runs the full length of Shepherd. If you can understand the city, I just told you everything you need to know about that bus route. Um, and in Houston, as much as possible, we try to make our bus routes match our street patterns. We try to think of that bus route as an integral part of the street that it's serving. And finally, inclusivity. How do we make a system that welcomes everybody? How do we make a system that works for you if you're in a wheelchair? How do we make a system that works for you if you're in a stroller? How do we make a system that feels safe for you if you're a woman and it's 8 p.m. and it's dark out, how do we make a system that makes everybody, regardless of race, regardless of income, feel welcome when they get on that bus? And this is part of the reason why we need diversity in who runs transit, why we need a lot of different perspectives in this discussion. When you talk to people about what keeps them away from transit, there's a lot of things that are very directly tied to their own experience, their own history the world that they live in. So all of these things, and these are obvious if you ride transit, but I would say overall we often don't do them very well. So what does all of this mean for Greenville? Here is your transit system right now for Upstate. You have um, multiple transit systems, none of them linked together, all of them infrequent. Um, the best service anywhere around here is every 30 minutes. Um, Notably, the 30-minute service already has higher ridership than the hourly service, so you can already see this proving out. But for the most part, transit in the upstate right now is a disconnected experience. It's an experience of infrequent five- or six-day-a-week service. It's an experience of fairly circuitous trips. But metro area size, you could really be a lot more than this. I, actually, I should mention this as well. When we talk about disconnectedness. Say you want to get from Greenville to Anderson. This is a very reasonable trip to make. What I've been talking to people since I've gotten here, it's amazing how much people travel between these different cities. What if you're on transit? 
Well, it turns out you get a choice of two departures a day. You can either leave at 9.40 in the morning or 6.35 in the afternoon. Tough luck to you if you want to travel at any other time of day. And Greyhound will charge you 18 bucks for that. That is the connection between two different cities close to each other in the same metropolitan area. So I think one of the things that part, that disconnected aspect of the system really stands out. Overall, given the constraints on service, it actually serves the population pretty well. The system footprint matches population density pretty well. So I would say the transit planners have been doing a good job spending the limited dollars that are out there. Um, I would also note that service serves low income population very well. Again, that footprint matches pretty well. But again, what we're looking at here is a footprint of hourly service. Um, if you compare Greenville to its peers, there are lots of metropolitan areas your size that have a lot more transit service. Um, and I think that one of my real takeaways here is this is a place that still thinks it's a small town when it has become a major growing metropolitan area. And the transit system and the transit ridership shows that. So you look at Oklahoma City has significantly more transit ridership. Grand Rapids, Michigan, Memphis, Tennessee, Birmingham, Richmond, Virginia. Like these are your peers. These are not Boston's or New York's of the world that all have significantly larger transit systems and significantly more transit ridership. Um, here's Nashville, for example. That white footprint is the footprint of 15 minute bus service. Remember, zero routes in upstate at that frequency today. Um, you look at Jacksonville. Jacksonville redesigned its entire bus network. Again, metro area roughly the same size as upstate. Um, redesigned its entire bus network around frequent routes, around express routes, which run faster because they stop less often, around new transfer points. Also one of the cities that, like Houston, has been growing its ridership. Hartford. We see major transit investments in cities of this size. This is a bus rapid transit linking multiple cities in Connecticut together. Really nice service, really nice stations. Um, and a bus guideway that gets buses out of that freeway traffic. So all the cars are stuck in traffic and the buses aren't. And a system that serves both express commuter buses and local service on the same route together. Richmond, Virginia a city that just redesigned its entire bus system around a new BRT line that links the whole network together better. Again, these are your peers. These are cities your size. El Paso has much better frequent transit networks. You can see again here a, a network of rapid buses fanning out. They even have their own rail transit line. They have major transit centers scattered around the region, not just in downtown, so they have multiple connecting hubs. Um, Eugene, Oregon, this is a city of only 358,000 people, um, which has a multiple center. So you've got Eugene, you've got Springfield, both with nice, nice downtown transit centers, both acting as hubs of their own networks, connected together, and connecting them together, a bus rapid transit line with dedicated lanes in city streets, um, and really nice boarding stations where you can buy your ticket on the platform and board on the train. And this is obviously not your first step, but I think this is a reasonable thing for this region to aspire to. I think this is a reasonable thing to think about. We are a place where we have the kind of population and trip dynamics that could actually support a system like this. Uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, 324,000 people, has its own BRT system, dedicated lanes from buses connecting the university into downtown. So what would I do looking at Greenville? First of all, simplify those routes. We talked about those loops already. We talked about a system that is hard to understand that takes people out of their way. And this plan already exists. This plan just needs to get funded and go ahead. And just what I saw in that comprehensive operational analysis, Greenlink knows what to do to make the system a lot better. And this is the kind of thing that can be implemented effectively overnight. It can happen in the next service change. Secondly, add frequency. Hourly is not good enough. Hourly is causing people's lives to be significantly worse than they ought to be. All that frequency is is money. And we talked about this. Everything green here is once an hour. 
you ought to be seeing a lot more 30-minute routes. There are probably places where there ought to be 15-minute routes. All that is is money. Doesn't, it doesn't take a lot of time, doesn't take a lot of thinking. What it takes is money. Seven-day, all-day service, like I said, not having Sunday service really leaves people out. And if you look at that comprehensive operational analysis and what it asks people about what matters to them, that later service and that weekend service really stood out as something everybody's asking for. And now let's get a little more ambitious. Focus on corridors. And I think this is a really important idea, that transit should be part of the form of the city. And that if you look at the transit system already, there are some routes which stand out. There are some segments of routes which stand out as high boarding segments. What I would advise you to do is think about what are your prime transit corridors going to be? What are the corridors that are going to matter for the next decade, for the next decades? Where are you going to focus your investments? Map out these are the places where we think good transit fits. And there's two reasons for that. One is it means you can have a long-term predictable plan for where you invest your resources. And that could be at first, let's make the service easier and simpler. Then it can be, let's add frequency, let's add span. In the long term, it could be, let's add rapid bus, let's do dedicated lanes, let's do better stations. But if, that, if you understand the shape of your network, you can identify those corridors. The second thing is, you can actually plan development around this. You can have your land use regulations fit your transit network. You can say these are the corridors where we want to see growth. These are the corridors where we're going to put public offices and public facilities. These are the corridors where we're going to encourage companies to locate. You have the chance right now to think about what your transit system looks like and to grow the city around that. And there are cities that have done that. This is what Charlotte did with a corridors and nodes type of urban plan, their transit system is following their comprehensive plan for how they want to structure their city. You have the opportunity to do that right now. But again, that's not merely a transit thing. That's a transit and development thing. And five regional connections. This is a region. This is not a lot of little towns which happen to be next to each other. This is a very connected economic region with very connected travel patterns, and right now, a series of isolated transit networks. This is the kind of thing you could be thinking about. You could be thinking about a map where all of these corridors connect together, where all of these cities connect together, where you can get on a bus in Greenville and go to any of these other places. You can go out to the airport, and you can go to Clemson, you can go to Anderson, and I'm not talking commute service from park and rides. I'm talking about service that goes from one transit network to another. I'm talking about service that goes from one walkable place to another. There is very real demand for these kind of connections. And if you can, as part of highway expansions, actually put in some HOV lanes, let those buses speed by the traffic jam, this could be very compelling service that a lot of people would use. Again, that's not your first thing you do. But if you can be planning for that right now, you can start putting pieces of this in place. It can help this entire region work better together, which also gets to that key word, together. You can't solve this just as a Greenville problem. You can't let every county handle transit by itself. You have to start to think about how all of those connect together. Fundamentally, here's what transit is good at. Transit is good at moving lots of people in a long straight line with reliable frequent service to walkable places that increase access to, unfortunately, there it goes, that increase access to everything people need in life. That's a formula for transit and it's a formula for land use and if you put those pieces together, you can make an effective network that makes people's lives better every day and that makes the entire region work better. And that takes a little ambition to think of right now, but it's obvious this is a place that has ambition. Everyone's mentioning the Swamp Rabbit Trail. Now, like, the, nobody thought people would be bicycling until we built this thing, and then we did. People, like, nobody realized we had a waterfall, and then we tore down the bridge, and we built a park, and now it's one of our favorite things. Like, this is a region that has already shown the ambition of saying we can be more than we are right now. We can be a different kind of place. And I think if you show that ambition for transit, there's some real opportunity. And I'll leave you with the title of my book because I think this is an important point. This isn't about trains or buses. This is about people. Transit is about making people's lives better. 
And if we do that well, we can be a better place, a better city, a better region. Thank you very much. Thank you.